Seit 2006 und insbesondere seit Beginn des NSU-Prozesses 2013 fordert der Vater von Halit, Ismail Yozgat, dass Verantwortliche des NSU-Prozesses eine Vorortbesichtigung im Internetcafé, in dem sein Sohn ermordet wurde, machen. Dies geschah bisher nicht. In seiner Rede am Gedenktag 2016 sagte Ismail Yozgat, und ich zitiere, denn Temme lügt. Temme hat entweder meinen Sohn erschossen oder die Mörder gesehen. Sollte es keine Vorortbesichtigung geben und die Ungereimtheiten von dem damaligen Mitarbeiter des hessischen Untersuchungslandesamtes für Verfassungsschutz nicht aufgeklärt werden, weil der Senat Temme glaubt, ist für uns das gesprochene Urteil bei Beendigung des Prozesses vor Gericht nichtig. Wir werden das Urteil nicht anerkennen. Ich wiederhole, der Verfassungsschützer der Regierung hat meinen Sohn entweder getötet oder hat die Mörder gesehen. Zitat Ende. Um die Analyse und die Forderungen der Familie Joska zu unterstützen, hat das Tribunal Forensic Architecture um ihre Mithilfe gebeten. Denn wir alle haben eine Verpflichtung gegenüber den Opfern und deren Familien, die wir einlösen müssen. Darum gibt es das Tribunal. Erste Ergebnisse dieser Untersuchung wurden vor zwei Monaten am 6. April in Kassel veröffentlicht. Heute zeigen Forensic Architecture weitere Teile ihrer Untersuchung und wir sind gespannt auf ihre Präsentation. Damit übergebe ich das Wort an Eyal und Christina. Thank you. Um, thank you for this invitation. Thank you, Aisha, for the introduction. I think that um, when presenting you the, the, the results of our investigation, it is important to say that the team that has undertaken that investigation is the same team that in uh, recent years has undertaken investigation in various um, areas of conflict worldwide. It's a team of um, Israeli and Greek uh, uh, architects, but also include Syrian architects, include photographers and filmmakers from Britain and from Germany. And I think that I would like to start with that statement in order to um, impress upon you that sometimes the human right gaze that is very, tends to be very Eurocentric, okay? it comes from Europe, European human rights groups are investigating human rights violation in other places worldwide can also be inversed. And that in a situation when distrust in the state institutions and in the police is so low, um, we need to sometimes apply the same techniques uh, of human rights investigation that uh, we would apply on, on, on other places. And, and this is really um, the heart of what counter-forensics is. Counter-forensics comes uh, not to replace um, police investigations. In fact, in counter-forensics, very often it is the state institution, like the police, like the court, like the secret services of all their uh, different variations that are those that are being investigated. And um, sometimes for a counter-forensic investigation to take place, we need alternative forums, not only alternative methods. And I think that this tribunal is an, a, an, an excellent example of uh, an alternative institution, an alternative forum that pops up precisely because the existing state forums in which that subject has been presented and debated are inadequate, as we heard in a very beautiful um, uh, theatrical reading that happened uh, right before us. 
The tribunal is also important because our testimony, as some of you might have heard, uh, was denied in, uh, or we did not get the opportunity to present uh, in the Munich uh, court that was uh, scheduled for, for yesterday. But still, I think that that is, this, this very fact makes this tribunal even more important. It is there to discharge this duty to the German public and the families of the victims and in this case, particularly to the Yosgat family, uh, for um, the investigation and for the truth about this event to still uh, be searched and uh, to be presented. Everything that we have um, investigated in this case, and this is yet another very important feature in our investigation, is open source material. That means material that exists, that is available, to everybody. What we do in forensic architecture is that we look again, we, we go back to material and we take a long and sometimes very intense look at material that is, that is everywhere. We work, we cross-reference bits of data and uh, we make our determination on precisely that which is available for everybody, that which is available to the public. And in that there is also a kind of a, a call and a lesson in looking at what, what does it take uh, to look carefully uh, at evidence. Our question is very different than the question of the police. It is not our question, uh, as we uh, got commissioned from the tribunal, was not to say who killed Halit Yozgat on that horrible evening on the 6th of April 2006, but to investigate a testimony and to say, whether the testimony of a particular individual, Andreas Temer, uh, we heard about him before, um, is at all possible. And therefore, we kind of intensify the question onto a very, very small point. Uh, civil society forensics cannot, like the police, look at all the killings that have taken place with all intense uh, uh, intensity and somehow uh, the question from the tribunal was to focus all our attention. And when I say focus all our attention, it's a team of about five or six people that spent uh, the past six months almost exclusively looking at nine and a half minutes and 77 square meters, right? And these are very important, this short duration of time and the 77 square meter. Because in that 77 square meter, and during that nine and a half minutes, we have the participants, or representative of all the participants that somehow make this drama. We have obviously um, the communities that uh, have suffered violence. We have also, uh, of course, the killers that, that performed it. But we also have a state agent, so we have the state the murderer, and um, the, um, uh, the victim. And it is also possible that two of those parties are actually one. Um, so we need to, uh, in fact, answer or shed light on this very small question of the 77 square meter in the nine and a half minutes so that much larger questions uh, could emanate from it. Of course, you know um, the reenactment video. Um, opa, you know the uh, how to go back. Yeah, you know the reenactment video from Dresden. Because the command that was leaked back in 2015. As I said, in, in our office, usually we look at videos of bombs falling in Gaza or in Iraq or in Syria. And we undertake a very, very close analysis uh, of, the, um, of the video. In fact, for us, this video, this reenactment video that Andreas Temer has actually filmed with the police a few weeks after uh, the killing, when, when his presence was discovered, is the alleged violation, right? So we, we are not looking here at a representation of an event, but we are looking here at a crime, at potentially at an alleged crime as it is taking place, right? So we analyze that crime. 
uh, the crime of treachery, and from it, uh, whatever else um, uh, would be implied uh, of it. So what we undertake in those six and a half, in, in those six months that we were working on this project is a certain reenactment of the reenactment, right? a representation and analysis, a very detailed analysis of that representation. Now, uh, in order to do it, we needed to uh, basically construct, I said, we are, we, are, we are looking at 77 square meter and nine and a half minutes. We needed to reconstruct both the time and space coordinates uh, of that event. So uh, we, we are starting from, um, Oh, is it playing? Okay, just uh, right. Okay, yeah. So, so we are starting from from the photographs, and it is really from the photographs that that exist that, we, with our techniques, we are able to reconstruct uh, more or less uh, the space uh, of the shop uh, and travel through it. Uh, this is uh, a technique that moves from image to space. It's an image to space analysis. Uh, in which all the, all the images that are very familiar are now somehow directly located in space. But computer presentation was not enough. We needed, in fact, we realized that in order to get to the degree of certainty that would make us comfortable with our determination is that we have to, uh, in fact, construct this place in one-to-one. -one. So uh, this was never exhibited, it was never open to the public, but uh, the Hakave in the late culture has enabled us to, uh, to build that space. It was up for exactly three days, and in those three days we've undertaken many, many tests uh, that you would see uh, later. Something that is very contemporary and perhaps very interesting about that case uh, from uh, an analytical perspective is, of course, that this is a murder that has taken place inside an internet uh, shop. All four witnesses in, and Teme are actually logged in to time-coded devices. So we have um, the, the log-ins and log-outs of uh, people coming in and out, as you would see, create a kind of a framework a time framework, and then the space, create a spatial framework within, the, within which the incident could take place, right? So um, a, now what we needed to do was to cross-reference between testimonies. Testimonies are obviously description, verbal description of uh, people from memory. Um, and to locate the testimonies in between those log-ins and log-outs. From our experience in forensic architecture, we know that uh, very often traumatized witnesses, people that experience uh, harsh violence, um, something uneasy, there is something not direct and linear when you try to reconstruct the recollection. Sometimes periods of time that appear very long to them are shorter, sometimes the other way around, sometimes there are black gaps within people's recollection. Um, what we have here is both kind of being tuned to the logic of testimony, to how testimony operates, but we have also the boundaries of time in which the different events could take place. We also know from our experience working in many, with many victims worldwide that people do remember sequences of events much better than description of duration. Um, now verifiability for us effect is verified when we can cross reference between human memory, uh, a digital code in this case, uh, on the log-in and log-outs of the events, and physical and spatial data. When those come together, and, and each one of those facts supports another, we are content that we've established an element within this investigation and can move on. 
So here uh, we will present to you today um, the next step of our analysis uh, that is very much concentrated uh, on a time-space framework of the event, um, very much narrated from um, the, uh, the logins. So we know that around 4.30 in the afternoon, Halit Yozgat, sitting uh, over here, is alone in the cafe. There is no one else uh, in. At about um, 16.46, the first witness, Ahmed Abu Tamam, enters into the shop. He approaches Halit Yozgat at the front desk and goes to his um, computer in, uh, uh, in this location, uh, exactly. It's, I think it's PC7 and logs in at 1646. At this moment, he switches on uh, a game uh, that is called Call of Duty. Now, we, we, we find it um, perhaps ironic that two of the witnesses are playing uh, a game that the essence of this game, the aim of this computer game, is to shoot Nazis on a, on a kind of imaginary battlefield, while during the same time, a Nazi is killing one of their friends. The next person um, to come in is Emre Ergin. Uh, he logs in at 1648 and sit at PC3 over here uh, with his face uh, to the door. He also switches on Call of Duty. Uh, the next witness to come in is Hedia Kaliskan and her daughter Seren. Uh, during this, uh, this event that we investigate, she would make two phone calls. Uh, the first one begins between 1650 and 1651. Now, there's something important to, to tell you about uh, phone call logs, that uh, the login is, is conserved as one, in one minute resolution when the phone begins. So we don't know exactly within the one minute when it would begin. But on the end of the call, it is logged in on the second. So this is why we know that she starts uh, within a one minute resolution. This is uh, where she is uh, and her daughter. The next person to come in is uh, a frequent uh, customer to this uh, shop, Andreas Teme who sits on his uh, computer and logs in in 1650-56 uh, and switches on um, a dating site called ilove.de. The next one to log in is Faiz Hamadi Shabab. He would also make two phone calls. The first one would begin at 1653, or between 1653 and 1654. And the second one would end at 1703.26, right? So this, the time of Hamadi Shabab's two phone calls, when he enters, here he is entering into the booth. At the time he entered into the booth, uh, Halit Yozgat was sitting, he described sitting and seeing Halit Yozgat at his desk. When he would exit his booth, Halit Yozgat uh, would know uh, would would be shot twice uh, and on the floor. So the entire event that we investigated is within um, the uh, time frame of two phone calls uh, by uh, Faiz Hamadi Shabal. Um, we'll hand on to Christina, who is um, directing this investigation at Forensic Architecture. So the question we are called to answer is exactly what time did the murder happen within this absolute time frame of our investigation? And where was Andreas Teme at the time? So we know that although Teme logged in at 1650, uh, only a few minutes later, 501, 40 seconds, he logs out. And so the first question we were asked is, is it possible that um, Teme wasn't even present at the time of the murder. 
To figure that out, we had to go back to the reenactment video, which takes one minute and seven seconds um, from the time that Teme claims to be logging out until he walks through the shop, goes, uh, goes to the front, tries to find Halit, goes back, and then um, leaves a coin on the desk and eventually gets into his car and leaves. So is it possible from the point that he gets into his car that the murder happened then? It leaves us 39 seconds from that moment, the last moment that Teme was, had the visual contact with, with the shop, and the time that Faiz, Faiz Hamadi Shabab exits his phone booth. Therefore, And this is the time frame we are investigating. So our question here is, is 39 seconds enough for a series of actions leading to Halid's death to take place? Firstly, to examine this scenario, we have to assume a very unlikely hypothesis. Halid needs to have left the shop unattended while five customers were inside. But where would he go? There is no witness who saw him outside. Therefore, this scenario is already conditioned to be highly unlikely. We tested how long it would take for this series of actions to take place. After Teme would exit, at this precise, precise moment, Khalid would return, shortly missing Teme. We have reenacted this scenario both in a digital simulation but also in the real scale model that we have reconstructed in Berlin. Khalid would return and sit at his desk. Immediately after, the killer would come in, shoot Khalid twice, look over the desk, and then leave. Faiz Hamadi Shabab would then exit his telephone booth. Adding up these separate actions in a highly coordinated and controlled experiment amounts to 35 seconds. This is in lab conditions. In a real life situation, there would need to be gaps between these actions. Our reenactment establishes that there would be no more than four seconds in total between these actions, which renders this scenario highly unlikely. In real life, actually, people don't miss out by a split second. Actually, people are not directed by someone who's telling them exactly the moment that they have to move. Further on, we look back at the witness testimonies. Hedeya Kaliskan testified that she heard the sounds of the gunshots after she began her second phone call, which began between 5.01 and 5.02. She says, the connection came immediately. After my daughter came in, then I heard the sounds rapidly, one after the other, roughly as if someone was knocking against the door outside. She was sitting in the booth right next to, to the desk where Halit was. Faiz Hamadi Shabab also testifies. Approximately, approximately during the first call, I heard something like a balloon exploding. I have turned around but couldn't see because of the pictures on the glass door. I was a bit busy with entering the pin from my maxi card. I tried to look through the slot on the side, but didn't see. His first call is logged between 6.54 and 5.01, sorry, and 6.54, sorry. 16. <laughs> 16.54 and 16.15. Um, no, that, this is also not true. <laughs> Uh, his first phone call was actually, um, his second phone call was actually logged between 5.01 and 
According to his testimony, therefore, the shots were fired before his second phone call would, went through. So while he was inputting the PIN number on his maxi card. He is also the only one who was in the same room when the, kill, that the killing uh, took place. And he saw the killer. He says, for a short moment, I have noticed something. Somebody going in or out. I, hadn't descri I, I can't describe it more precisely. I think the person went out. I stood with my back to the glass door, my head leaning to the phone. So this is what he could see. And on, a, on the corner of his eye, he saw someone move in. Okay. These testimonies allow us to reduce the possible time of the murder to be between 5.01, the earliest time that Hedija Kaliskan could have begun her second phone call, and 5.02, the latest time that Faiz Hamadi Shabab could have begun his. Therefore, it is not possible that Andreas Teme had left the internet cafe at the time of the murder. However, according to these testimonies and login data, it is possible that the killing took place within the first 20 seconds after Teme logged out. This is also supported by Ahmed Abu Tamam's testimony, who claims to have heard the loud sounds after Teme left the internet cafe, after Teme left the back room. In this case, Teme would have collided with a killer. Here, what we have done is superimpose Teme's movements in space according to his reenactment, so the timing is according to his reenactment, with the trajectory of the killer according to the timing suggested by this scenario. We then examined the possibility that Teme was still at the back of the shop, sitting at PC2 when the murder happened. This scenario has been accepted by the court in Munich. In this case, the question is whether Teme would be a witness. To be a witness, Teme would need to have some sensory contact with the event. So, was he able to hear the sounds of the gunshots while sitting at PC2? Did he smell the residual smell of gunpowder chemicals left in the space? Did he see the body of Khalid that was lying dead behind the desk when he left a coin on the desk, according to his reenactment? To test the audibility of the sound, we contracted a specialist weapon analyst, Armament Research Services, to record the sound signatures of the weapon and ammunition used for the murder. The weapon is a Cheska 83 pistol, and the ammunition is 7.65 millimeter Browning bullets. It was, there was also a sound suppressor used. The experts went to Arizona and recorded five. This is the CZ, no suppressor. We then compared them to the sound signatures of three other guns of a similar caliber. The Colt 32, that is also of the same caliber, was threaded with different sound suppressors. This is the Colt 32 with a wet suppressor. The suppressed gunshots were never below 130 decibels. Back in Berlin, we used, um, we sourced a high decibel loudspeaker and located it at Measurement the Measurement one, of the killer. high level gunshot. Start now. Measurement end. Measurement two, high level gunshot. Start now. Measurement end. This is the calibration process from one meter away. We then tested the audibility of sound from Temer's seated position at PC2. Measurement one, gunshot. 
starts now. Measurement end. Measurement two, gunshot, start now. Measurement end. We are corroborating these results. We have created two separate models, one of the actual um, space that we used in Berlin and another one of the, of the real space in the internet shop in Kassel. And we, have, we are doing within that uh, sound simulations that show exactly the, the propagation of sound within this space. All of those results or all of those simulations result uh, to the number 89.1 decibels. This is the sound level at the position of Andreas Temer's seated position at PC2. This is around 35, um, I mean, around 35 decibels above the maximum ambient sound level that is expected in such a space. Therefore, it is clearly audible. 89.1 decibels is the equivalent noise of a freight train at 15 meters away. When we played the sound in Berlin, everyone in the space was deafened by what they heard. It was so clear that uh, the sound, the gunshot, was was actually perceptible. Therefore, we are able to determine that uh, the gunshot is definitely aud was definitely audible by Andreas Theme should he be sitting at PC2. We then simulated in Berlin the amount of gases produced by the two gunshots. These gases would carry smell in them. And so when Andreas Theme would walk in the front of the space, um, just 38 seconds after up to 38 seconds after the, the murder had happened, he should be able to, to smell it. This is the hypothesis. We are now collaborating with the Dr. Salvaro, Dr. Salvador Navarro Martinez and his team at the Imperial College in order to calculate the dis dispersion of residual particles in space. What you see here is a digital simulation of the, um, uh, the particles that, that carry the smell within the, um, within the space. This is coming from two gunshots. We are also looking at the way that those particles occupy space in a three-dimensional way. For us, it is important to see how this space is, that is created, it is a cloud within which the, the threshold of, of perceptibility is just a volume through which um, the witness would come through. Whether he missed the cloud or not is something that we're still investigating. We will very soon be able to determine whether the smell was perceptible to, pen, to Teme. Finally, we tested Tema's ability to see the body of Khalid as he left, and when he placed the coin on the front desk. We simulated his vision within our 3D model. We have calculated the digital camera to match his height and angle of vision as it is revealed on his reenactment video. So what you see here is a digital reconstruction of what he would, he would see in space uh, while, while doing the, the movements that he claims to be doing through his reenactment video. Of course, we are using this video as um, an original piece of testimony, a testimony spoken by the language of his own body. And we consider this the most fav favorable account to him. Therefore, our question is really, if according to him, 
it is possible that he missed the body. We then confirmed this result with our own reenactment in the real scale model. What you see here is an actor who is wearing a camera uh, um, mounted on his head at the eye height of uh, Andreas Theme, who is also reenacting re his movements moment by moment as, um, as Theme reenacted them on his own video. The body was clearly visible in both cases. We have thus determined, with a high degree of certainty, that Temer's testimony is untruthful. Thank you. Vielen Dank an dich, Christine und Earl, sowie an das gesamte Team in London für eure sehr präzise und wichtige Arbeit. Wenn wir Earl Weizmann folgen, dann stellen sich, ausgehend von den 77, 77 Quadratmeter des Internetcafés, komplexe Fragen auf. Wie die Frage nach der Rolle des Verfassungsschutzes, der Polizei und somit auch der Rolle des Staates innerhalb des NSU-Komplexes. Auf der Mikroebene des Internetcafés kommen die komplexen Rollen und Funktionen von Handelnden des Staates zusammen, verdichten sich und werden erkennbar. Das Zusammenkommen dieser Verbindungen zwischen Mikro- und Makroebene im Internetcafé zeigt die dringliche Notwendigkeit dieser Untersuchung und sowie die politische und gesellschaftliche Dimension des Tatortes. Es zeigt auch, dass es einen, Gesell einen ges gesellschaftlichen Auftrag gibt. Es macht deutlich, warum das Tribunal notwendig ist und warum das Tribunal Forensic Architecture beauftragt hat. Den lauten Klang der Schüsse, die Andreas Temme nicht gehört haben will, obwohl er ein Experte für Waffen und ein Scharfschütze ist, sind trotz eines Silencers nicht sehr durchdringend und unhörbar. Diese Schüsse wurden von juristischem Apparat nicht angehört. So wie auch die Zeugenaussagen der Betroffenen, besonders die der Familie Josgat, in den letzten elf Jahren nicht gehört und immer wieder gesilenced wurden. Die Praxis des Silencings, ein Ignorieren und ein Leisedrehen von Stimmen oder auch von Sound, ist eben nicht nur eine technische Handlung. Es, ist immer auch, es gibt immer eine Wahl zwischen hören wollen und nicht hören wollen. Die Wahl zu hören oder nicht zu hören wollen, ist immer eine politische Entscheidung und eine politische Positionierung und Handlung. So wie der Schalldämpfer der Ceska-Pistole die Lautstärke der Schüsse nicht wirklich unhörbar gemacht hat, haben wir den wahren Ablauf der Ergebnisse, der Ereignisse nun gehört und wir sind alle Zeugen geworden. Das Tribunal fordert den Staat und die Öffentlichkeit auf, diese Schüsse zu hören.